Since the beginning of time, humans have faced problems in which specific actions were needed to settle them, and through these actions, a strategy was discovered that would make overcoming these problems much more manageable and feasible. Teamwork. However, when multiple humans worked together to accomplish a common task, leadership was needed to guide them along in their actions and create a vision of the end result. This kind of effective leadership is crucial if the team wishes to be effective in what they do, and history has truly been shaped and changed by this kind of leaders. The question, what quality makes a good and effective leader, is one that does not have one specific answer, for many different qualities can make a leader that other men will follow and give of themselves to. Some of these distinguishing characteristics can make a man a moral leader, one that gives of himself before anyone else and fights for the common good, but they can also make a leader that accomplishes evil rather than moral acts. However, whether their intentions are evil or moral, the effectiveness of their leadership cannot be questioned. This film will explore, of the numerous qualities of an effective leader, four that have enabled different men to change history with their leadership, despite the insurmountable odds that they were up against. These men were William Wallace, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, Abraham Lincoln, and Adolf Hitler. Four leaders that changed the world. Sir William Wallace was born around the year 1270 in Scotland, the son of a little-known Scottish knight. There is little documentation about his early life, but he probably learned to fight and ride a horse at an early age. Because he had an older brother, William did not receive his father's title of a knight or any of his land. He reportedly grew to a height of over six feet tall, which was very unusual for someone living in this time period. Wallace dedicated his life to the liberation of Scotland from the King Edward I and English rule. King Edward served as arbitrator for the Scottish throne and tried to make Scotland fight for him against France. This turned the Scots against Edward, since they did not want to fight his battles. Edward then turned on the Scottish king by marrying the Scottish king's son to the French king's niece and demanded that the Scottish castles on the border of England and Scotland surrender to the English. After the Scottish refused to surrender, it was only a matter of time before there was a war. Edward marched his armies to Scotland and conquered the country in 1297. The Scottish people, including William Wallace, soon began to defy the English rule. Wallace recruited some followers and began to attack the English, and, in May of 1297, he and his men avenged his father's death by killing the knight who was responsible. By killing a knight, Wallace had become the king's enemy. Wallace soon had a small army under his control that attacked garrisons of English troops throughout Scotland and achieved many victories, such as that at the Battle of Stirling River. He was a brave and charismatic leader, as well as a great warrior and an intelligent tactician. Soon, Scotland was almost free of the English forces that had taken it over. Wallace had the power to unite the knights and commoners of Scotland in the fight against the oppression of the English. Because of his patriotic motives, he was able to rally the common people to his cause, since they were also looking for freedom. Wallace began to invade England in October of 1296. After returning to Scotland, he was given the title of Guardian of Scotland. However, Edward came back to England from France about this time and decimated Wallace's army. Wallace was forced to relinquish his position as Guardian and retreat into the forest nearby. Edward acknowledged Wallace as a traitor to the English crown and pursued him throughout Scotland. Wallace was chased until a Scottish knight betrayed him in August of 1305. Wallace was drawn and quartered and instantly became a martyr for Scotland's fight for freedom. Robert the Bruce, future King of Scotland, would go on to succeed and gain Scottish independence. William Wallace was viewed as a national hero for his dedication to freedom. His dedication was apparent in that he continued to courageously fight for Scottish freedom against odds that made it almost impossible. He was also a great leader in the eyes of his soldiers, who admired him for his great courage, and with this he was able to rally people to the cause of Scottish independence. Even though Wallace was forced to kill many people on his conquest to free the Scots, he did so for what he believed to be a noble cause. He did not want to see innocent people being oppressed by the English, and knew that they needed to be fought and driven out of the country. Wallace's impact on Scotland can even be seen after his death. By killing him in such a barbaric way, Edward ignited the passion of the Scots' rebellion, 
even though he was trying to crush their morale. In one action, he had gotten rid of one of his enemies and made many more enemies in the process. William Wallace was a great leader and hero of Scotland. His contributions to the Scottish freedom remain an important part of the country's heritage and will never be forgotten. He believed in what he was fighting for and was a great leader in that respect. The National Wallace Monument overlooks Stirling Bridge, one of the places where Wallace fought his battles in the name of the freedom for his country. Since the stakes are high in any war, good leadership is crucial to any military. These military leaders have not only the duty of leading their men in order to ensure their survival, but they have the more important duty of ensuring the protection of their nation. Centuries later, as the American Civil War threatened the United States of America with disunity and secession, the Northern United States needed good military leaders to fight for it and ensure the preservation of the country. Of these men, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain proved himself to be an effective leader in combat with many distinguishing characteristics of his leadership, one of the most effective being selflessness. Chamberlain had grown up in Maine in the early 1800s and as an adult was a professor for Bowdoin College in Maine. After the Civil War had begun, Chamberlain took a leave of absence from his career and volunteered for the Union Army in 1862, despite the fact that he had a family. Because of his educational background, he accepted a leadership position as Lieutenant Colonel of the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment, and leading these men, he fought in many battles throughout the duration of the war. However, perhaps his greatest moment in the war came during the Battle of Gettysburg. On the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, Chamberlain, newly promoted to Colonel, and his men had been assigned to hold the extreme left of the Union line on the hill known as Little Round Top. Confederate soldiers came up the slope fighting in waves, but Chamberlain's men repeatedly fought them off and caused them to retreat. However, Chamberlain's men soon exhausted most of their ammunition, and many of his men had been wounded or killed. Seeing this, Chamberlain called together the officers under him and announced that they would fix bayonets and charge down the slopes. Upon his command, the regiment charged and took many of the Confederates captive. This act of courage saved not only his regiment, but also saved the entire Union Army. This is because if he had not ordered the charge, the Confederates would have been able to flank all Union forces. Chamberlain's acts that day would later earn him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Chamberlain was known for throwing himself into the heaviest part of the battle when his men were fighting, and this truly became evident during the Battle of Petersburg, later in the war. During the battle, Chamberlain grabbed the flag after the regiment's flag bearer had been killed and urged his men to advance. At that moment, Chamberlain was shot in the right hip and the bullet began to exit his left hip. Leaning on his sword, Chamberlain continued to command his men to advance and he eventually collapsed due to a loss of blood. After denying medical attention until after his men received it, Chamberlain was expected to die and an obituary was prepared for the papers. However, he survived and continued to fight for the rest of the war, and as the war finally came to a close, he was chosen to accept the formal surrender of the Confederate Army at Appomattox. Chamberlain finally died from the wound he received at Petersburg in 1914. In his military career, he had fought in 20 battles and had been wounded six times. Chamberlain was not afraid of combat, and this fearlessness allowed him to lead the men of the 20th Maine to glory in the war. Also. The selflessness that he displayed toward his men not only gained their respect, which is crucial for a leader, but also followed what Chamberlain knew to be morally right. The selflessness has not disappeared from the leaders of this military. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain had it when it counted, and truly, the effects of his leadership will live as long as this nation.